This is the lecture on front-end geometry. Um, for wheel alignment, of course, we, we need to minimize the rolling resistance. And please remember that this class is about energy efficiency. When you, if you go on the internet and look at turning scrub and bump scrub and bump steer, Ackerman steering, you'll see a lot of things because these things are really important in designing race cars. Um, and ours is a, our goal in this class is a little different from race cars uh, in that we want to minimize the energy consumption of the vehicle. But, I want to, but these things are very important to us too. As far as basic wheel alignment, this is mostly set by adjusting the tie rod length. We need the front tires to be parallel and pointed straight ahead when we're going straight ahead. If we don't get the tires pointed straight ahead, you know, if they're towed in the way I've got it shown in this drawing here, then um, we're going to waste a lot of energy. And not only that, but we'll scrub all the tread off the tires and we'll spend a lot more money on tires too. Turning scrub is the first thing I wanted to talk about. And when we turn a corner, um, the radius for the outside part of the tire is a little bit longer than the radius for the inside part of the tire. And as a result, the outside part of the tire has to go a little bit further in going around the corner than the inside part of the tire. And this means that there has to be some slipping between the inside and the outside of the tires. Wider tires have more turning scrub and narrow tires have less turning scrub. And of course, for performance, you know, for cornering, braking, acceleration, stability, wider tires are better, but for energy efficiency, narrow tires are better. I drew this little um, figure to help illustrate this. this. This over here is a tire and it's traversing around the corner here or through some angle theta. And we'll say that big R is the radius from the center of the turn to the inside part of the tire and R plus W, if W is the width of the tire, is then the radius to the outside part of the tire. And we go to the geometry, and if we turn through some angle theta, where theta is in radians, then we get this, this here, W times theta, the width of the tire times the angle theta. That's the difference in dense distance between the inside and outside part of the tire. And so it lets you know that the turning scrub is proportional to the width of the tire. And the wider the tire, the more turning scrub we're going to have. And this costs us a little bit of energy when we go around the corner. It's, it's not a big thing. The second kind of scrub is bump scrub. And as the wheels bump up and down, and of course as we go down the road, there's all these little bumps and the wheels are always moving up and down relative to the chassis. And we need to set the geometry so this contact patch, the point in contact with the road, moves straight up and down. If the, if the contact patch moves left and right, you know, hor horizontal to the car, um, it will scrub the tread off the tires, which is bad, and it will waste a lot of energy, which is also bad. And scrub is, bump scrub is not good for anything. We, we always want to minimize the bump scrub. And we do this by choosing the wishbone lengths. So I've got a little schematic here. This vertical rectangle is the tire. So I've drawn a very narrow tire here. And there's a lower wishbone here and an upper wishbone. And the dotted lines then we let the tire bump up some. And the way I've drawn it, you can see the contact patch move to the right just a little bit. And I've got, you know, from the center of the tire to the center of the bumped up position, we have a little bit of horizontal motion there, which is bump scrub. And this is bad. This is bad stuff. We'll, it'll wear all the tread off the tires. Now, if we choose the right geometry, the right lower wishbone length and the right upper wishbone length, we can make this tire so that the contact patch moves almost straight up and down uh, as we go up, up and down the highway and, and hit all these little bumps. It, it doesn't move very far, so we'll want to zero it out for a small up and down motion. 
and it comes down to choosing the right links on these upper and lower wishbones and how we connect them into the chassis. Uh, this is a little bit better drawing. I found this on the internet and we can label some of the components. This is more the shape of an automotive tire. You know, it'll be a, a wider tire. We have the brake disc is in here and the hub which rotates on the spindle. And there's, so there's like a, a little shaft in here that's called the spindle with bearings and the hub and the brake disc. The hub rotates on the spindle. The brake disc and the wheel are attached to the hub and everything is attached to the kingpin which is, is here. The kingpin has a pivot point at the top which will be a ball joint connection and a pivot point at the bottom down here also a ball joint connection and to make the wheel turn for left and right turns uh, we pivot this kingpin uh, on its axis the, between on the two ball joints. The way we pivot it is through this steering knuckle here and this steering knuckle comes straight out of the page from the kingpin so you have to imagine in 3D that it's coming straight out of the page and the tie rod connects to the steering knuckle here and so by pushing the tie rod to the right we'll push the steering knuckle to the right and the kingpin will rotate around its axis here these two ball joints which will turn the tire and that will allow us to make a left turn and the tie rod moves back and forth and that's how we we turn the front tires the lower wishbone and the upper wishbone are there for, for bumps and so that the tire can bump up and down and they control the geometry so that this tire patch moves straight up and down and we don't have any bump scrub. There's no shock absorber drawn on here but there has to be a spring and shock in here too to, to help hold position. Here's a couple of real front suspensions to help you go from the schematics to the real thing on the left here. This is a real nice drawing of a typical car suspension. So you see along here is the lower wishbone and it comes in this side and it, you can't see it very well coming on the back side. And the shock absorber and spring connect into the lower wishbone. It always does. You see the steering knuckle out here that kind of came out of the page on the last one and here's the tie rod and by pushing this tie rod back and forth that's how we we turn it this is the brake disc and here's the lug nuts the wheel mount onto the front these are the brake calipers and here's the upper upper wishbone is up here and you see how they sort of look like a wishbone uh, some people instead of calling them wishbones they call them uh, control arms or they call them A arms. Um, it's all the same thing. On the right, this is a home built model. It um, is probably for some small lightweight race car type application. I don't know what it is. I just found it on the internet and you could see everything pretty well. So at the top here you see here's the upper wishbone and the way they've made it and they've got an adjustment here so that they can adjust the length of that upper wishbone a little bit in with this part right here. But that's the upper. Here's the lower one down here and you can see the spring and shock are connected into the lower one. Here's the steering knuckle and here's the tie rod. And you can even on this one you can see the rack over here. This is the steering. This goes up to the steering wheel, this part here. And it goes into this little gearbox and then this is a rack that moves straight back and forth here and uh, the tie rod then connects in. So this is what it looks like and I've shown some diagrams and then some real pictures to help you visualize what it's going to look like. Uh, to minimize the scrub, all kinds of scrub and tire wear and everything, uh, it's good if we can make the lower wishbones a little bit longer. And so by narrowing the chassis a little bit, uh, that's always good. There's point of diminishing returns, of course, but we don't want really short wishbones or we can't control the geometry very well. Everything has to have a high stiffness. If there's any flexibility in the wishbones or the tie rods or, or anything, um, that always 
makes the geometry bad, causes tire wear, increases the energy, you know, it's just all bad. And so it needs to be stiff. And the connections has to be tight. You know, if, if we look, you know, these are all ball joint connections. Um, well, not necessarily back here, but these have to be really tight connections and no play in them at all. Any play in the connections, uh, once again, will let the wheel wander around and, and we get bad tire wear. It's just all bad. The kingpin axis, and if you notice, we don't, we could make the kingpin axis vertical uh, so that as we turn and as we make left and right turns, the, the kingpin pivots around a vertical axis. That's probably the simplest geometry to imagine. Or we could angle the kingpin so that the kingpin pivots around an angled axis, which is what we always do. If we go out to the center of the tire patch, See, when we brake, when we hit the brakes on the car, there's going to be a braking force between the contact patch and, and you know, the road and the tire. And if we make the kingpin axis go through that point, then the moment of that braking force around the kingpin axis is zero, which means the brake, hitting the brakes will not try to make the wheels turn. On the other hand, if we were to choose a vertical kingpin axis, there would be a significant difference here and the braking force would have a, a moment around that and we then braking feeds back into the steering system and uh, we don't want that. But actually we don't want it angled all the way to the center of the tire patch either and we, it should be somewhere in between, more like to this point right here. So I think I said about everything on this chart. I just wanted you to have some words if you went back to review this. So to minimize bump scrub, we want to select the links to minimize it. You know, and in general, longer wishbones are better. Um, and I've got a spreadsheet as part of the homework that you guys will use to zero out um, the bump scrub and everything. But the basic theory is you know, if we start with the, the solid lines or where, where we start and we let it bump up usually about an inch because we're just talking about small bumps here that we want to be sure we minimize it out. Then the lower wishbone will rotate, which means that this point right here has to move to the left a little bit because it's, it's rotating up through an angle. So that will tend to move the whole thing to the left. So we're going to tilt, we're going to let the kingpin tilt a little bit, the way I, you see the dotted lines are tilted a little bit, they're not straight up and down. And then we'll just use some geometry and figure out where, you know, here's where the upper wishbone was going to connect in and then we let it move up. This is where it would be if we move the contact patch up an inch. And then we draw the perpendicular bisector and where those intersect then that's where we want the other end of the upper wishbone. And so we want it to be this long. And by choosing that length, then we will zero out um, the bump scrub. And so we go through this design process. We've got the kingpin axis angled down to here and we let it bump up and uh, we choose the right ratio and the right uh, geometry here to zero out the bump scrub. We also want Ackerman steering. When the car turns, um, the inside wheel has to turn more. So um, this, this figure helps you just see the geometry and the derivation here. This is the center of the turn over on the left and the two rear wheels are going to continue to go straight ahead and the two front wheels will turn as we make a left turn. So I said, okay, we'll turn this inside one 10 degrees. And if you just look at it, you can see that, that the outside one is going to turn less than 10 degrees. So the inside wheel has to turn a little bit more. So ideally, we would like the wheels to be perpendicular to a line that goes through the center of the turn. So we've got a wheelbase, the distance between the front and rear axles, and a wheel track 
the dip distance between the center of the two front tires. And we can develop, you can just use geometry and, and develop how much this outer wheel should turn if the inner wheel turns 10 degrees. And this can help you in figuring out your Ackerman steering. If you don't get your Ackerman steering set correctly, then when you're turning, it's just the same as if the wheels were towed in or towed out. You know, you're going to scrub tread off the front tires and, and, and you're going to waste energy and it's just all bad. So we want to get this set correctly. A first approximation, and this is not exact, it's just an approximation, is if we took the point at the center of the rear axle here and we project through the kingpin axes, then if we locate the steering knuckle behind the kingpin axis where we normally put it, then it should lie on this line. And that will be approximately right. And for people doing their home built little race cars who do not have the sophistication to do all the analysis that you guys can do, this is where they'll usually put it. It's pretty close, but it's really not quite right. So we got to design this steering knuckle. Uh, we can put the uh, steering knuckle in front of the kingpin. It usually runs into clearance problems with the brakes and we almost never do that. So usually it's behind the kingpin here. And this illustrates how we're going to have to, if this is the axis of rotation at that point, then we're going to have to bring an arm out like this uh, to get that steering knuckle located where it needs to be. Another thing that goes with locating the steering knuckle and the tie rod is um, bump steer. And what happens is as the assembly bumps up and down, as we just drive on, you know, down the highway and all these little bumps up and down, depending on the length of the tie rod, it's going to pivot up and down. And as it pivots, there's a slight left-right motion because of, it pivots through an arc. And that can actually turn the wheel a little bit. And if you don't get the bump steer set correctly as you're going down the road, the wheels are just constantly going back and forth between toe in and toe out, and you're wearing the tread off the tires, and it's you know all bad stuff. So we need exactly the right tie rod length so that we don't get any of this bump steer either. It's a very similar process to setting the upper A-arm length we're going to let the tire bump up a little bit. This is where the steering knuckle is when it's down. If we go through perfect geometry, we say this is where we want it to be after it's bumped up so that there is no turning of the wheel. We draw the perpendicular bisector and we locate, you know, this is the length then that we want for the tie rod. And if we choose the tie rod that length, the whole assembly will go up and down together. The contact patch will go straight up and down and the wheel will not turn left or right because we've got everything chosen exactly right and that's how we want it. Uh, those two things are designed together uh, the steering knuckle location and the tie rod link. We have to, we're going to build some software in an Excel sped, spreadsheet and, and I've already got it built for you and we want to be able to optimize all of these things. Here's a schematic for a left turn. So we start with the two wheels straight ahead. Uh, you've heard of the rack and pinion steering. Well, the rack is a bar that, that just moves left and right in these linear bearings. And as it does, it pushes the tie rods left and right, and that makes the wheels turn. So here, at the bottom one is in the turned configuration. This, the rack moved to the right. You know, the, and the left tire turns a little bit more than the right tire because it's the inside one. And we're choosing everything, all of the geometry, to make that work out perfectly. Uh, we also have to have adjustments for toe-in and camber, and, and we usually adjust the toe-in with the length of the tie rod. So the tie rods may not be exactly perfectly. It's more important to get the the static toe right than, than to get the exact tie rod length. And of course, stiffness is really important. And that's the end here.